Hello and welcome to our today's lecture of introduction to mechanobiology. So, this would be our last week of this course and this week we will spend our time in discussing some of the tools and techniques that are used in the field of mechanobiology for studying the effects of physical forces on cell behavior and studying or measuring properties of cells, tissues relevant to mechanobiology. Okay. So, once again uh, just to recap what we have covered so far, we started off with our analogy of cell as a tent. Okay. From there we discussed the extracellular matrix and its properties in great detail. We went on to discuss about focal additions and how forces affect focal additions. From there we discussed cell migration and the various modes of migration that are possible. After that we started discussing about how ECM properties influence cell behavior and this was both in the context of normal cell behavior and in case of disease. Okay. So, in normal we discussed about regulation of stem cell fate by ECM stiffness and via modulation of cell shape. In disease we discussed about few cases related to cancer, atherosclerosis and muscular dystrophy. So, one of the ideas that I repeatedly stressed on was modulation or change in ECM properties or ECM or tissue properties. Okay. So, within our body we span tissues of multiple stiffnesses okay. starting from brain which is order 1 kpa in stiffness, muscle order 10 kpa and bone order 100 kpa. Okay. So, in order to study how cells behave in these different contexts, we must have a way of developing substrates where these properties can be regulated. And by properties you can have multiple different things, you may want to tune the stiffness, Okay. While studying the effect of ECM stiffness or bulk tissue stiffness in regulating cell behavior, you may want to tune nanotopography okay. So, if you want to see what is the effect of ECM organization you may want to regulate cell shape okay. and you may also want to measure quantify properties of cells and tissues. Okay. So, as part of the different techniques relevant to mechanobiology today we are going to discuss about hydrogels. So, what why is hydrogel important again because of its relation to ECM stiffness in order to make substrates which mimic the bulk properties of these uh, of different tissues what you do is you make use of hydrogels. Okay. So, that brings us to the question what exactly is a hydrogel. Okay. So, a hydrogel is essentially a water solen. polymeric structure cross linked together. Okay. So, the source of the cross link might vary, it might be chemical via covalent bonds, it might be ionic you might have simple physical entanglement okay. 
physical entanglement simple example is that of pasta okay so even pasta if you want to take out a single strand you require to exert some forces okay or you might have weak hydrogen bonding or van der waals force mediated forces okay so these are the different sources in which you can make the hydrogen okay so based on the type used you may classify hydrogels okay you may classify hydrogels broadly as homopolymers copolymers or you can have something called interpenetrating so homo refers to generally you have a single monomer which is being cross linked together to form a polymer copolymer you have two or more entities which are covalently or cross linked in case of an interpenetrating network so this is an interpenetrating network for example you might have a polymer network if a polymer network is allowed to swell inside another monomer you can also classify okay the polymers based on the process by which so how they are made you might have you might modulate heat pressure okay use photopolymerization or radiation like x rays okay so you can have multiple different ways and also i think the most important which i missed is chemical reaction okay so for making a hydrogel relevant for mechanobiological applications what should be some of the desirable properties okay what is desirable for a hydrogel okay so first and foremost the gel has to be non toxic to cells if you are want to you want to conduct studies where you are varying the stiffness over a large range you need a polymer where you can tune the stiffness of the of the network okay and so relevant to in vivo would be hundreds of pascals to thousands of pascals okay so you have a wide range it is preferred that the hydrogel is linearly elastic so if the material is linearly elastic then in our next class we'll discuss how this is this provides us ease in order to quantify the forces that cells can exert the hydrogel should be optically clear because you will culture cells on them so you if this optically clear then you can image them okay for doing phase contrast studies as well as fluorescence studies and the other thing so most of these hydrogels are generally inert so you should be able to chemically link or cross link your ecm protein of choice okay so thus you have a polymer where you can measure you make a material okay whose bulk stiffness e you can tune and this gel is typically functionalized this is your ecm protein of choice so that you can make it relevant to different contexts for example if you are working with neuronal cells and you are interested in behavior of neuronal cells in a brain mimetic environment this ecm protein might be laminin 
or in some other case if you are working with smooth muscle cells you might use collagen with E order 10 kilopascal so on and so forth. Okay. So, there have been several different hydrogel systems that have been used okay. among the most common ones and most widely used is polyacrylamide gels. You have another one which is very common polydimethyl siloxane. In short it is referred to as PDMS. You have polyethylene glycol gels, you have alginate gels. So, these will briefly will all fall under broadly the synthetic category. You can also make gels of natural materials so these would even among the most common is collagen gels you can make fibrin gels also so instead of collagen you might make use of gelatin and make gelatin methylated gels this gelatin is not stable at room temperature it solubilizes but if you methylate the gelatin and then cross link using uv then you can get gel gels nowadays you also have peptides or materials gels made of peptides and one of them is amyloid amyloid based hydrogels so though amyloid has traditionally been associated with disease causing but there are functional amyloids also and these amyloid gels have recently been used for differentiating stem cells into neuronal precursor cells. Okay. So, I will just discuss as to how you go about making these gels for mechanobiological study and I will take the polyacrylamide gel case. Okay. So, for PA gels, okay, so what you do? You link acrylamide so, you know that you run proteins for western blot on page polyacrylamide gels right. So, in page you have acrylamide which is cross linked with bisacrylamide. Okay. So, instead of making the gel in a uh, in a test tube what you do is you take a glass cover slip okay. you functionalize you treat this with aminopropyl triethoxysilane and then with uh, glutaraldehyde. On top of which you dump your polymerizing mixture, polymerizing solution. So, this polymerizing solution has TMED and APS in it okay, and these allow it to gel. Okay. So, if you let it sit this will form a network. So, the gelation time is dependent the concentration of acrylamide. So, higher concentration of acrylamide will typically help or higher concentration of acrylamide or bisacrylamide. So, higher amount of cross linking protein will ensure that this gel gets uh, polymerized much faster. Okay. Now, as I mentioned briefly that these gels are inert. So, if you plate cells directly on these gels nothing will stick cells will not stick and your ECM protein will not absorb. So, what is used? is a hetero bifunctional cross linker. Okay. So, this is called sulfo sanpa okay. one of which is linked via UV onto the substrate of the PA gel. Okay. So, this one end attaches onto the gel and then once you have done this you know th this cross linking then on top 
you can functionalize with your ECM protein of choice. Okay, so this might be collagen, laminin, fibrinogen, so on and so forth. Okay, so first of all, so far as tuning the properties of the gel is concerned, you can you have two things to control. Okay, so let's say this is my crosslinker concentration. Okay. So, if I use a given concentration of acrylamide and I keep changing the crosslinker concentration, I will get and let us say my y axis is the stiffness that I will get, gel stiffness that you will make. So, you would see at a given concentration of the acrylamide, you will get curves like this. Okay. So, there is some basal stiffness and then you increase the crosslinker then your stiffness saturates. Okay. The thing the saturation behavior is because that once all your all your uh, monomers are crosslinked then there is no additional crosslinking possible no matter how much you add the crosslinker. Okay. So, this is let us say at concentration acrylamide concentration of A1 if you increase A1 to A2 you would get similarly curves which shift upward. Okay. So, this is concentration A3, this is concentration A2 and we have A3 greater than A2 greater than A1. Okay. So, you can tweak in order to get a gel of given stiffness, you can change either the monomer concentration which is your acrylamide or the crosslinker concentration which is your bisacrylamide. Okay. Now, the beauty of acrylamide gels is that it has been found that the PA gels are linearly elastic. So, what is the meaning of linearly elastic? So, if you plot, if you if you if you exert a given amount of strain and measure the stress, okay, so this is a straight line with a slope being E. So, E is the Young's modulus of elasticity. So, for linearly elastic materials E is constant, okay. for linearly elastic materials E is constant. Okay. So, using these systems variety of studies have been performed. Now, one of the question is for a given cell type okay, on what basis do you call a gel a soft gel versus a stiff gel. What might be your basis for calling a, a substrate soft or stiff? So, you would anticipate that what is soft for a neuron is not the same as soft for a muscle cell or not the same for a osteoblast. Okay, so, this is not true. So, and this perhaps depends on the ability to exert forces. So, a cell which cannot exert too much forces so even 1 kPa might seem stiff. Versus a cell let us say a cardiomyocyte One kPa. So, cardiomyocytes are cells which exert lot of contractile forces. One kPa might appear to be soft. Okay. So, how do you find out given a cell type what what is something as soft or what is something as stiff? Okay. So, one of the ways of doing it, okay, one of the ways of doing it is actually to measure the cell spread area as a function of stiffness. And what you will get, you will get these saturating profiles of cell spread area and you can fit if this is my area A and let us say 
E is a substrate stiffness. So, you can define area. So, this is an example of a hyperbolic curve. Okay. So, you can fit it with an expression okay. So, you have a constant this constant is equivalent to this value here okay. this constant and you have this kind of a profile. So, what you backtrack so E is the substrate stiffness which is an experimentally measured quantity area is also a measured quantity. So, you can backtrack this value of K E L okay, or some elastic matrix. Okay. So, for a muscle cell for a smooth muscle cell this K elastic constant turns out to be order 7 to 10 kilo Pascal. Okay. But this K E L provides a way of quantifying whether a substrate is soft or stiff for a given cell. So, you can say that a, for a cell with a given K E L which you determine soft can correspond to when E is significantly less than this value, stiff is when E is comparable to this value and rigid when E is significantly greater than this elastic constant. So, one thing I mentioned that given a gel, okay, given a gel, you functionalize it with some ligand. Okay. So, the, the measure that the, the quantify that you measure either in terms of cell spreading or cell motility is not only dictated by the substrate stiffness, but it is in a collectively determined by substrate stiffness value and the ligand density. So, if your ligand density is very high, okay, if your ligand density is very high, you might expect a different response compared to when ligand density is low and, and these kind of experiments have been performed. So, this is a you know standard example let me say in terms of spreading okay, as a function of stiffness. So, you might see if your ligand density is low okay, versus when ligand density is very high. In this case what you observe is the maximum spreading is observed at some intermediate stiffness value. While when the ligand density is very low what you find is increasing amount of stiffness leads to increased spreading. Okay. So, this shows you that this is another important parameter that you must tweak in your experiments. So, depending on the phenomena that you are trying to probe this might be a different value. Okay. So, for, for these particular experiments the authors found that in ligand density low what they observed was a biphasic speed effect in speed. So, when they track the speed when it was low you found maximum motility on a stiff surface when it was low when it was high then the maximum speed was reversed and you got the maximum speed on a softer surface. Okay. So, this is also very important to think of as to what concentration of ligand that you should choose. So, another aspect which has to be taken into consideration. So, we generally draw the gel like this and these gels are typically cross linked onto glass cover slips. Okay, which is rigid for the cells and on top of this you have a gel. So, though I am drawing the gel like this you would imagine for the same cover slip. So, what you do is while making the gel you put a single drop order 15 to 25 microliter drop onto let us say a 25 mm cover slip diameter cover slip 
and you put another cover slip on top okay which is hydrophobic this is hydrophobic so when you place it on top what you get so in side view this is top view okay and in side view this is what you will have you have your bottom cover slip you have your gel which will spread out uniformly and you have the top cover slip so this is your bottom cover slip and this is your top cover slip and this is the gel that you form so instead of using 15 to 20 microliters if you used 40 microliters or 100 microliters this height will change okay so what depending on how you are doing for the same substrate you might make a gel which is this thick or you might get a gel which is very thin okay so what indirectly you are changing by changing the amount of volume that you are putting is you are changing the height of the gel that you get so this substrate so even this gel resting on a stiff surface if the gel is thin then it turns out that the cell can actually sense the substrate thickness okay substrate stiffness okay so if i do this experiment in a controllable manner where i have a phl i have a phl of height h okay and on top of which i am plating cells so what has been observed is if h is greater than 70 microns and you get a given spreading behavior okay if you keep the making the gel thinner and thinner so for example if i plot the spreading response for a 500 nanometer gel what you will observe okay so this is for 70 microns thick gel this is for 500 nanometer thick gel okay so this is my spreading area this is my stiffness so what you observe is for the same value of area okay a soft and thick thin gel okay appears to the cell it appears like a much thicker gel okay soft thin gel is equivalent to a much thick stiffer gel okay so you don't want to incorporate the effect of substrate or glass stiffness on what you are measuring so for this people have shown that if your height of the gel is greater than 70 microns then you are assured that you would won't have any effect of the rigid effect or rigid glass effect on the measure that you are quantifying okay. one last thing i want to mention okay so while these studies these gels are mostly uniform stiffness gels it is possible using microfluidics okay, to generate gradient gels okay, where if this is what your substrate you would have and this is your gel okay, you would have a gradient so this is your glass this is your gel you can have a gradient in which one end is soft and one end is stiff. Okay, so you can generate a gradient stiffness and the reason for doing this kind of or making these gels is to demonstrate or to study the effect of durotaxis. Okay. What is durotaxis? Durotaxis suggests that is it is refers to the motion in the direction of a stiffness gradient. So it has been demonstrated in mesenchymal stem cells, fibroblasts, etc. cells and these cells have a propensity to migrate towards the stiffer end of the gel. Intriguingly very recently it was observed that ovarian cancer cells exhibit reverse zeurotaxis which means that if you plate cells on this gel you would find all of them tend to migrate towards the softer end. So that is it for today, I stop here. So in, in summary, I have given you an idea of what an hydrogel is, what are some of the properties which you need to 
keep in mind which gel system we would prefer over some other gels. I did not get a chance to discuss about native gels like collagen or fibrin or methylated gelatin where ligand density and stiffness are all related because the same network which is giving you the adhesive ligand that concentration is also dictating the bulk stiffness of that network. And you have that scaling relationship of G prime scaling as concentration cube for collagen gels. Okay? So, the behavior of cells in those nonlinear elastic materials varies, varies drastically from that observed on materials of linear elastic. Okay? With that I thank you for your attention and I look forward to talking to you again in next class.